All right, Romans chapter 13. Uh, we're focusing in on the very first portion of this chapter here. And my sermon this morning is going to be political. I'll just give you a heads up right off the bat. It's a, it's a very political sermon. I don't do very many of these. I don't get too involved in politics. I, I think politics are dumb. I don't like them at all. Um, but I do follow them. I like to know what's going on in the world. And there have just been some things that the way that this country is going, it just drives me insane. And I'm going to vent a little bit this morning. So forgive me because I, I, it drives me mad seeing, even seeing Christians not using biblical guidelines and biblical principles in how we ought to be, whether selecting someone, you know, a representative in our government or, or the way that the government ought to be operated, all these different aspects. People have been so brainwashed into a very secular mind on, on the way things ought to be. Now, I realize there is a separation between the church and the state in this country, and I'm not saying that a pastor needs to be you know, running everything or that we need to have a state-run church. But what I am saying is that this book is truth. Amen. This is God's word. And, you know, anything else, any other books that have been read, you can read Socrates or Plato or any other philosophers or anyone else. Look, this is the truth. Amen. That's, God, that's man's opinion. Man come up with philosophies. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. I'll tell you what, whenever they're good and whenever they're right, they line up with this book perfectly. When someone else comes up with a principle or something else that sounds good, it's going to line up with this perfect because this book is the word of God and this is the truth. So this is where we need to have our foundation laid. And too many people don't have this foundation as their, their guiding light to lead them in the principles that you need in order to get, if you are going to get involved in any type of politics, whether it's through voting or, or lobbying or what, whatever it is that you do. And I'm not necessarily endorsing any of that, but just, just to give you good principles to make the decisions that you need to make. The first thing, the first point I want to make as we, we talk about Romans 13, we'll just read this a little bit. Let's read through these first few verses again, starting in verse number one. Because a lot of people have, have, have taken this first, well, I'll get into that in just a second. Let's just, let's just look and see what the word says. The Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. This is a power structure that has been ordained by God. God is saying that there are, and just to give you some examples of the power structure that God has ordained, one, of course, God is the ultimate authority, right? Nothing supersedes God. God is the be-all, end-all in far, as far as the power structure goes. But God has also ordained other structures. So he's also ordained a family structure, a husband, wife, and children, and the Bible says that the husband is the authority in that power structure. It talks about the wife being uh, obedient unto her husband and the children, of course, being obedient to their parents. And that God has said, okay, within the family, the father is at the top. He makes the final decision, the final say so. Below that, you'll have the wife and then the children at the bottom. He's also instituted government as having a legitimate authority within our lives. Now, I'll give you a disclaimer right off the bat so you know where I'm coming from. Politically, my point of view is very, very libertarian. I think that we should have a very, very small government. I, I think that we need to use, we ought to have a government, but we ought to have a government that, that fits what God has ordained it to do, the purpose of government. And we'll see that in Romans chapter 13. See, unfortunately, we've expanded government into doing all these things and, and getting involved in all these areas of our lives that the government has no legitimate authority over. That has been given by God, at least. Yeah. See, there's, there's usurped authority. They have no idea what they're there's, doing about it. That's right. There's, there's all kinds of things going on with our government. And the, the problem is that Anybody with enough force can usurp authority, right? I mean, you have the guns, you have the, you know, you can say, this is what's going to happen. I mean, look at the totalitarian governments over time that have gotten involved into so many little details of the people's everyday lives. Look at communism, look at socialism, look at, look at all these, these examples that we have of dictating what you can and can't do on a very personal level. God did not ordain that power for government. That is not of God. That has been usurped. That has been an overreach, an overstepping. 
give you a real clear example of that, and we'll go back to the family structure, right? I am a husband of a wife, and I have a family. I have the, the God-given authority within my family to make those decisions, but you know what? I can't say to Brother Sebastian's wife, to Michelle, just say, hey, you need to do this, and you know, and that's not completely outside of my realm of authority. If I tell my wife, hey, I need you to make me lunch for work tomorrow, that's acting within my realm of authority because she's my wife, but I can't go to someone else's wife and tell her to do the same thing because that doesn't work like that. They've got their own husband. That's their own authority structure. So with government, it's the same thing. God has ordained a power that government has, and he says, this is legitimate. This is why you have a government in the first place. But this, that's where it stops. We need to be looking to the Bible for where we get our answers on where, what power they even ought to have in the first place. So verse number two, the Bible reads, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So whatever powers God has ordained, we shouldn't be resisting that. Now, within the family, you might have children resisting the power that their parents have over them or the wife resisting the power that God has ordained of her husband being in charge. But it's the same thing in government. You know, we ought not to be resisting. You know, if you break the law and do something bad, and I mean something legitimate where it's like you stole from somebody and the government has been established to determine, you know, who is at fault, you know, the, the, the truthfulness of the matter, and to be able to convict and punish the evildoer, someone who's broken the law and done something bad, you need to be able to just say, okay, well, that's my punishment. That's what, you know, that's what I deserve, and not resist that power either. Verse number three is going to explain exactly that. It says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. This is explaining what God has ordained the power of the government to be. The rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So I'll read the next verse, 2, verse 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. The, the ruler is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. God has ordained government to be able to arbitrate between disputes when there's, when there's someone is wronged, to be able to take the force to say, okay, this person you know, needs to stand before a, a jury, before a trial, has to be judged and have all the facts presented and laid out and if someone is found guilty, the government's authority is to carry out the sentence against that person. That is what has been ordained by God. Because we don't have individual authority to just take matters into our own hands and just execute our own justice against people and be a revenger and just, and just do these things. That is outside of what God has given us as our own personal authority, just in general, when it comes to other people. We can't just go out and, and you know, if I didn't like something that you did, you know, maybe one of you backed into my car in the, in the parking lot, and then, well, I'm going to go get retribution. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to take a bat. I'm just going to smash up your car because it's the same way that you did to me. I don't have that authority to just take that upon myself. God has instituted a government in order to be able to take care of all kinds of problems like that. But do you notice, this is where the power lies. It doesn't lie in taking your money to give it to somebody else to help them out. It doesn't lie in, in any of these other extra services. It doesn't lie in telling you what kind of drinks you can drink, like soda, whether it be soda, whether it be alcohol, whether it be any of those things. That's not in their, you know, and look, I'm 100% for the record, I believe drinking alcohol is a sin. I believe drinking any amount of alcohol is a sin. Amen. Now, some people might say that's extreme, but I believe that's what the Bible teaches. But I don't think it's the government's job to, to ban the sale of alcohol. That's a personal decision that we make that is outside because consuming alcohol, you're not doing evil to somebody if you, if you, if you get involved in sin. You're not doing evil against someone else. The, the government's there for the prosecution, for the, for the judgment against evildoers. People who literally do wrong to somebody else. 
If you put something into your body, you're affecting yourself. You're not doing any wrong to somebody else. So I don't believe that the government's role is to start dictating all of those different aspects of your life. And that may be a little controversial, but I, I think that's where the power ends with government is just being able to say, this is right, this is wrong. Because some sentences are going to need to, uh, are going to require the death penalty according to the Bible, according to what God has deemed is what is just. We don't have the right or the authority to go and carry out a sentence and execute that type of justice against someone else. God has given that specific power to a governing authority, not to myself. Even if someone, God forbid, if someone were to, to, to kill one of my children or my wife or something, you know, someone really close to me where you, where you <laughs> other people would look at you and be like, well, that's pretty justified, you know, if you were to, to go out and do that. But that is not given, that power has not been given to me by God to go out and be a revenger of my, you know, on my own, to go out and do that. It, it, it's something that needs to take place where there is someone that can execute ju justice. But it's, it's, it's in the realm that God has given as authority. Now, there's a view out there today that says, that where people think that every president the United States has ever had has been selected by God, and that's the president that, that we're supposed to have today. So, like, people will think, well, Barack Obama, you know, Christian will be scratching around. I don't know why, but, you know, God's smarter than I am. He must think that, that he's the one. And you know what? That's false. I do not believe that God is just completely controlling everything that happens on this earth. He's not. He's given us free will. He's given us the ability to choose between right and wrong, between good and evil. Now, can God step in? Can God have influence? Can God, can God lift up someone and, 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 and abase another person? Yes, he can. He has the power to do those things, but he's not just up there just manipulating and controlling everything. It's not the way God operates. But this view that says that you know, God's sovereign, he controls everything, and in regards to government and who becomes elected and who's in charge and all these other things, it's propagated further by the, the new modern perversions of the Bible. I'm going to read for you what the NIV says and what the Living Bible says. From We just went through Romans chapter 13, the first four verses. Not that difficult to understand. I mean, we read through it. It's talking about the powers that are ordained by God, and it talks about you know, the powers that were given. But look at the different wording, and I'll just read it for you. Obviously, you don't, you don't have the book in front of you. But the NIV it, uh, reads in verse number one, it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against, God, against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Now, we're, we're shifting some words, and it's very subtle. It's very subtle what's happened between the powers and now the authorities. It's, it's, it's not that great, of, not a huge difference, but there is, there is a difference there between that, that what God has ordained as being a power because if we think about the authorities today, and people could turn to this verse and then say, well, you can't resist the authorities, right? Because who are the authorities? Now, we have police officers that are authorities. We have all these other things. They're the authorities. So even if it goes against the power that God has given them, they're not authority. You know, it's not the authorities of, you know, the person. It's what God has ordained to give them. But an uh, even more crazy version, the Living Bible, it reads, I'll read this for you. It says, Obey the government, for God is the one who has put it there. There is no government anywhere that God has not placed in power. And see, this is where, this is where you really start getting into weird doctrine when you start reading these types of versions. There is no government anywhere that God has not placed in power. So those who refuse to obey the laws of the land are refusing to obey God and punishment will follow. So what that's saying is, okay, so if you refuse the laws of the land, I guess it's saying that people who refuse the laws of the land in Nazi Germany, they're just disobeying God, right? Or in Stalinist Russia, if you disobeyed that government, the governing authorities, then, then you're in dis, you know, disobeying God. No. Absolutely false. Because that would make like the, you know, the Apostle Paul and even Jesus Christ himself sinners doing things against what, you know, you know Look at how many times he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. 
And they were doing things that the authorities told them not to do. But it was okay. It was justified in God's eyes because the government didn't have that authority to tell them what they can or cannot preach. They did not have the authority to tell them they cannot convert people to Jesus Christ because they don't have that authority. You could go to another, you could go to Israel, for example, and it's illegal to try to proselytize you know, Jews to be Christians in Israel. It's against their law, but they don't have that authority. Right. Now, they've usurped authority and they've got guns and they've got people that will, will, will enforce those laws, but God hasn't given them that authority. That is not of God. And you look at something, and this is why, the, you know, this is just one example. I like to bring this up from time to time, how different versions say things. We believe that the King James Version, for those of you that, you know, for, if you're here for the first time, is the Word of God and that God has preserved this Word throughout time and that we have it today in the English language and there's so many hundreds of versions in the English language right now and they all say different things. And, and you can't have things that, that say different things be the same and all be the Word of God. And it's, it's, there's a lot of reasons for it, but I'm not going to get into all those today. But I just wanted to point this out here. I'll keep reading because it's, it's actually a little comical. It's sad, but it's comical, the, the way that this is completely butchered, this verse. It says, There is no government anywhere that God has not placed in power. So those who refuse to obey the laws of the land are refusing to obey God, and punishment will follow. For the policeman does not frighten people who are doing right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but those doing evil will always fear him. So if you don't want to be afraid, keep the laws, and you will get along well. <laughs> it, 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 it's just funny. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> Think about like any time you've ever been pulled over, are you just like, eh, no problem, you know, or like everyone tenses up and gets a little nervous, you know, it's a, you, <laughs> you got a guy with a gun coming, you don't know what he's going to do, I don't know, but, uh, and I'm not against guns, I just, to take this book and say the word of God, that's a shame, Amen. because that's not God's word, that, that, that is so full of contradictions, even within its own pages. God doesn't, doesn't make uh, inept errors like that. But let's continue on here, because there's a lot I want to get into. Romans 13 is just our start. Now, I wanted to kind of bring up the realm of government, because what I'm doing today is, is, is hopefully I'll just trying to instill some, some biblical principles on how our outlook of government should be. And I'm going to be looking at some of the people who are currently you know, running for the office of the President of the United States, and we're going to look at, at some of the things that I believe ought to be deal breakers just right off the bat. Okay, just at a bare minimum, if you are going to consider someone that you are going to cast a vote for and say, I am choosing that this person ought to be the one who's basically in charge of, you know, being the president of the United States. And I'm not going to get into all the, you know, executive, legislative, and judicial branch. You should all know that already and, and how much things have changed into what the design, you know, the, the executive branch is turning into a, a, all of the power residing in that one office. But that whole issue aside, if you're going to be saying, I'm going to cast a vote and I want this person to represent me, I want this person to be in this office of executing justice in the land, of, of leading our military, of making decisions that, that's going to have very, uh, a lot of ramifications just within the policies of our country. There's two things that I have that I think just ought to be automatic deal breakers no matter what. Number one, the Bible says, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. I do not want a fool in charge of this country. Not, I mean, absolutely not. If the Bible is saying, you're a fool if you think that God doesn't exist. Right? So if there's any atheists that are, and I don't know, I don't know that much about all the different candidates, but I mean, if someone's going to say, God's not exist, God isn't real, that person right off the bat is a fool. No way. I don't care. And look, I don't care what their economic policies are. I don't care what their foreign policy is. I don't care about anything else that they say. If they say that there's no God, that person is a fool. They have no understanding of, of anything as far as I'm concerned. What I, what I believe is that God calls that person a fool and I don't want a person that's a fool ru ruling over us and, and, and running this country. The other thing is anybody that says, an unborn child 
is not a person or doesn't have a right to, to live and, and to survive. And that, that what is inside a woman from the time that she, is, she conceives is an actual child, if you don't understand that concept, I don't want you running you know, this country and, 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 and being in charge of the presidency. Amen. Because to me, that's just another fool. Right. Or an extremely wicked person that's going to say that it's okay to kill a life. And we're just going to call it a choice. Do you believe well, I believe that the government is, you know, one of the responsibilities of the government is punishing evildoers. So if somebody were to take a human life, yeah. then they need to be punished for that. So that's where the legislation would be. It would be when someone aggresses against the innocent person, the innocent person in the womb, yeah. and someone goes in there and kills that life. The Bible says life for life. Right. That's, that's, that's what I believe. And I'm going to get into that in just a second because I'm going to go through some of these candidates. But it's fine. That's fine. It's, it's, uh, I'm gonna, I will get into that. I do have that on here. But um, those are two things that I think are just right off the bat deal breaker. If someone has this type of a, of a belief where they don't believe in God or they just think for some reason it's okay to kill an innocent child, I don't want you in charge of anything at all. I don't want you, I don't want you in charge of telling me what I'm going to eat for dinner tomorrow. Okay, let alone running the whole country. Amen. Now, I've got some, um, some quotes here. We'll start on the left side of things, which <laughs> this is just, just really easy to eliminate on this side because there was an interview given just recently, and this is one of the reasons that prompted me even to preach a sermon because I heard this, and, it, and it's like, it's mind-boggling that so many people can support a person who says things like this. There, there was an interview given with, with Hillary Clinton, and the question was, when or if does an unborn child have constitutional rights? Right? Is it, when, when does that happen? When someone's on, you know, is it in the third trimester? Or do they even have constitutional rights at all? Clinton responded, well, under our laws currently, that is not something that exists. The unborn person doesn't have constitutional rights. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't do everything we possibly can in the vast majority of instances to, you know, help a mother who is carrying a child and wants to make sure that child will be healthy to have appropriate medical support. It doesn't mean that, you know, don't do everything possible to try to fulfill your obligations. But it does not include sacrificing the woman's right to make decisions. You know what's how they just call conveniently murder decisions? Right. Well, let's just make it a decision. And, and just downplaying what it really is. And throughout her discourse here, she says the unborn person, she recognizes the fetus as an unborn person, she says, that wants to make sure that child will be healthy. In every answer she's given here, she's calling the unborn a child and a person. Right. She's acknowledging that, and she's just saying, nope, but you still have the choice. That's disgusting. And, and it boggles my mind that so many people could just be, you could rally behind a person like that. That's insane to me. And, and, even, and even the left is getting angry with what she said because they have been trying for so many years to, to separate a child or a person in these types of terms. And that's why they keep on talking about the fetus and the blastocyst and these cells. And, and they, they try to talk about it in terms that dehumanizes the child that is inside of the womb. And, and that is the, the, the big way of their propaganda to try to get people convinced that, well, it's not really a child. So at this point, it's not really a child. You're not really killing anybody. It's not really killing a child because it's just a fetus. We'll just call it another name. And that makes everything okay. So, excluded, right off the bat. And we, you know, there's so many other issues you could say the excluded for, but 
Right off the bat, just no-brainer, done. I don't even have to listen to one other word that she says. That's enough. Bernie Sanders, same thing. Bernie Sanders, I think, is even worse, at least in what I've read. Now, I am not an expert in Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. So I, I read this because there's a website that's got all their voting records and all these things that they did. Bernie Sanders voted no on banning partial birth, birth abortion except to save the mother's life. So the bill was introduced to say, we are going to ban partial birth abortion, where, where the, the, the birth is literally happening, but they're gonna, you're going to kill the child right before the actual birth. And, he, and, and they said, okay, we're going to put a, a caveat in here that if for some reason that would save the woman's life, which I don't agree with anyways, but if that, if that were to save the woman's life, then that would be allowed. That would be acceptable. But that's the only instance and he said no. And this is what it said. It said, Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act of 2003. Vote to pass a bill banning a medical procedure which is commonly known as partial birth abortion. The procedure would be allowed only in cases in which a woman's life is in danger, not for cases where a woman's health is in danger. Those who perform this procedure would face fines and up to two years in prison. Oh. And I mean, look at that. Like, all they're doing is, is oh, you have to pay a fine. You've killed a life, a baby that was coming out of the womb. And you've got a fine and, and up to, you, you might even face two years in prison. You might. The women to whom this procedure is performed on are not held criminally liable. And he would not even vote yes on that. He voted no. What type of a devil do you have to be to say, it's okay to kill a child that's coming out of the mother's womb? That is wicked as hell. I'm sorry. That is, that is a devil. That, that, is, that goes way beyond what a lot of people you know, in the, in the pro-choice movement, if you want to call it that, the, 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 the pro-death movement. You know, there, there's definitely a, 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 a spectrum there of people who believe in that. And this is just on the far wicked side of things. That's insane. And, and what, what, dry, what boggles my mind is how many people follow a person like that. How wicked has this country become? Now let's look on the right side of things. There's, there's, and I don't have everyone here because most of the times on the right, you're going to see, okay, here's my two issues, right? You got the, the abortion and... and people who, who are atheists, and, and no one on the right is going to necessarily fall into that category, but this is real interesting, too. I'm going to bring up Donald Trump. And one more announcement, just for, the, just for the record, I'm not for any of these guys, okay? Any of these front runners, any of these guys that are right up at, just so you know, I mean, we know where I'm coming from, I don't believe in any of them. And now, I don't care if you're for them or not. I don't. That doesn't matter to me at all. I don't expect everyone to agree with my opinions on things but what i'm trying to do and when we're getting to a lot of this is the bible aspect of our principles and what we should be using to to help us make up our mind and make judgments on things okay but i just want to throw that out there just so you know you know i have i have no dog in this race whatsoever i thought it was interesting though i saw recently donald trump couldn't even answer if a mother that has an abortion should be punished because he says well i'm pro-life he says i'm pro-life but then they, they, they pressed him on it because, you know, in, the, in the, the liberal media, they want to get people fighting and everything else. And they say, well, what should be happening? You know, if you want this against the law to have an abortion, you know, it's against the law. So then a person doing that is breaking the law, right? And yes, that's true. But the Republicans squirm and they don't want to answer this question. And, and they think that if for whatever reason, it's really unpopular. You know what? I don't care if it is unpopular. I don't care if 95% of the world thinks it's wrong or, or unpopular. I'm going to stick with what God says. And look, if, if you're going to participate in the murder of an innocent person, you need to be held responsible for participating in the murder of an innocent person. Whether or not the person is inside of the womb or outside of the womb doesn't matter. But he was being pressed on this question. Pressed on this question. He didn't want to answer. He's trying to dodge it. Trying to dodge it. Couldn't get around it. When he finally said that, yeah, she should be punished, he couldn't even say how. He didn't want to answer that at all. He just wouldn't, you know, just, well, I don't really know how. Ah, yeah, I don't really know how she, you know, maybe fines, maybe something, you know, like he didn't really go into detail on that. 
It's funny how a man that can make such a plain, simple argument about immigration and say, well, they're illegals. They've broken the law. They need to be, you know. Hey, that, you know what? That argument makes sense. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are following me. You say, well, if, if something's against the law, now they're breaking the law. That makes it illegal. Okay, sure. That logic follows soundly. All of a sudden, when it comes to abortion, it's real muddy and I don't know how to answer that. Instead of saying, well, yes, no, that, it should be against the law because you're taking innocent life and whoever does that should be punished. It's simple. And then I found out, and I didn't even know this because this, I'm surprised this didn't get more public, you know, publicity. He actually backtracked on even saying that the woman who gets the abortion should be punished. And I found this quote. It says, if Congress were to pass legislation making abortion illegal, and the federal courts upheld this legislation, or any state were permitted to ban abortion under state and federal law, the doctor or any other person performing this illegal act upon a woman would be held legally responsible, not the woman. The woman is a, get this, he, says that, he said this, the woman is a victim in this case, as is, the, as is the life in her womb. How are you a victim? It's like saying... <laughs> I don't want to go. I don't. I don't want to get into that detail. But <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to think of a, of, a, of a nice way to put things. You know. I mean, a whore that goes out and lays down for a man, will, completely willingly. It would be like, well, now we just got to punish the man. Right. No. When when a woman goes in and 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 says, signs up, I want this done. That's not a victim. That's a willing participant. That's an accessory to murder. I mean, it's, that's the, why is this so difficult to comprehend? He says, my position has not changed. Like Ronald Reagan, I am pro-life with exceptions. That's what Donald Trump said. Now, I'm also not saying that if a candidate has those two things right, as far as the, you know, the pro-life thing, and the thing that they're, they're worthy of a vote that they're even worthy of you saying, yes, I endorse this person. Because when you vote for someone, that is what you're doing. And I'm sick of this mentality of saying, well, we've got to choose a lesser of two evils. I, no, you know what? No, I'm not going to endorse evil. Amen. I'm not. And, and people say, well, if you don't vote for this person, then that person, look, that is not, the, it's, a, it's a faulty logic to say, if you don't vote for this person, you are voting for that person. No, I'm not, because I'm not endorsing that person. I'm not going to endorse anyone who I believe is wicked and ungodly. Let's look at the Bible. Now, let's go, I've kind of ranted for a little while. Let's, let's go back to the Bible. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 18. In the Old Testament, we're going to see some principles here. 2 Chronicles 18. And this is actually really important. And, and um, this, I, I don't, this doesn't really even get preached. Well, there's a good reason for that, too. But... Um, Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 18. There's, there's, there's one thing that I think every single politician has done that, that, and, and stands for, in my, in my memory, like I, I can't remember the last person who, who didn't take this stance. But we're, I'll, I'll, we'll get to, to the exact reason here in a minute. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 18. I want you to see this. There's a story here about King Jehoshaphat. Now, in the Old Testament, during the reign of the kings, after King David, when his son Solomon reigned, Israel was unified as one nation. But because of what Solomon did, God took the kingdom away from him and divided it up and, he, and, and split the kingdom into two. So you have the kingdom of Judah and then the larger kingdom of Israel. Okay, just, just to give you some history for those of you that might not know, we're in the book of, of Second Chronicles here, which is recording the different kings during this time period. There's two kingdoms. Second Chronicles 18, verse number one, the Bible says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. So he made this, this treaty with, he made, he made this, um, you know, 
an affinity of saying, you know, if someone attacks you, you know, we got your bag. If, you, you know, if someone attacks us, you're, you know, this, this alliance, right? Now, Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. And in the Old Testament, typically, the kings of Judah were more righteous, more godly. They were following the Lord. And the kings of Israel were more wicked. Now, in this specific example, Jehoshaphat was a righteous, godly king. He was a good man, according to the Bible. And he, was, he was doing right things. He was following the Lord. And he had a heart to serve God. But Ahab was an extremely wicked king. And Ahab was the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat made this alliance with them. Look at verse number 3. It says, And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people is thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. So Ahab now is involved in a war. And he's saying, Hey, look, I'm at war. We've got an alliance. Come help me out. Right? Are you going to stand with me? Are you going to fight for me? Of course, we've got an alliance. You know, my people are thy people. We'll, we'll go and help you out. So they go. He fights the battle. Ahab dies in the battle. Okay. Jehoshaphat comes back. Look at uh, chapter 19 now, because we're not going to go through all the battle and everything like that. It describes the battle and everything that happened and how treacherous Ahab was anyways, because Ahab was the one who wanted Jehoshaphat to get all the attention because they knew they were after him. And Ahab's the one who disguised himself when he went into the battle, so he didn't appear like the king. But um, look at verse number 1 of chapter 19. Jehoshaphat returns, right? Verse number 1. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, so this is the prophet of God coming out to rebuke Jehoshaphat. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So for this reason, the king decided to get involved and to make an alliance with a wicked king, who, by the way, was the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat said, I stand with Israel. I am pro-Israel. I am for Israel. He helps them in their battle, in their fight. He comes home. The prophet of God says, shouldest thou help the ungodly? Because you did this, because you joined an alliance with a wicked king and a wicked nation, wrath is upon you from God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want God's wrath upon us. I don't want God's wrath upon us. Now, it's going to happen the more wicked we get, but when we have every political leader saying, I stand with Israel, guess what? Israel hasn't changed. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. The people in Israel today deny the Lord Jesus Christ. I hate to break it to you. Right? It might be shocking to you. But the people over there, they, you know, by and large, I'm not saying 100% every single person, but as a, as a nation as a whole, they reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They are anti-Christ. If we have a leader that says, I am going to do, you know, I stand with Israel. They're saying, I stand with the ungodly. God's attitude of helping the ungodly has not changed. Right. And God's wrath will be upon us. Amen. I do not endorse people that's going to bring God's wrath on this nation. 2 John 1, 7 says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Again, that's what that land consists of over there. And it's, it's interesting how it's all of a sudden the Christian thing to do to support Israel. By deceivers who, who twist uh, Scripture out of context... That's, that says, oh, we need to, you know, when God made a promise to Abraham specifically, I will bless him that blesses thee and curse him that curses thee, singular, talking to one person, Abraham, they just apply that to an entire nation for all time. Of just, just well, from that time forward, just, just anybody who curses Israel is just cursed of God. And that is not what the Bible says. Right. It's talking about Abraham specifically. 
Now turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 17. The fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Because the Bible actually gives direction. And, and the last place we're going to turn after this will be 1 Samuel 8. Because God never, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself, but it's important to understand, this, God never prescribed for there to be a king. God never said, hey, this is the way I want your government to set up. This is not what God ordained as the power, to, the structure that, be, that is to be. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 17. I, uh, you know, the Bible talks about the judges and people who judge the land and where God was the ruler of the people. God gave his law. And God said, this is what you ought to follow. And you could go through God's law and you see if a person transgresses this way, this is the punishment for that person. If they do this, this is the punishment. You know, whether it be stealing, whether it be adultery, whether it be murder, whether it be, you know, all these different instances that could come up in a, a, a legal framework of transgressions and um, punishments, penalties. God gave all of that. And I, I think God's sense of justice and what's right and wrong is better than man's sense of justice. Amen. And I'm going to trust God's sense of justice over any man. And any godly type of government is going to mimic what God has ordained as, as being a legitimate punishment for laws. And I think that the only way we're going to find true justice is by going to the book uh, itself, the, the book that God has given to us. Now, he also, though, did, he understands man, he understands the heart of man, and he knows that, that man wants to have a leader, that they want, you know, there, there's reasons they're going to end up being like the world. God knows the beginning from the end. So in Deuteronomy 17, he basically says, okay, look, I didn't ordain for you to have a king. It's not what I wanted for you to do. But one day you're going to have a king because you're not going to be able to take it. And if you decide to have a king, this is what it needs, what he needs to be. This is who you need to find to choose to be your king. So look at verse number 14 of Deuteronomy 17. Now, we don't have a king in this country. Just start off saying that. We're not yet, right? <laughs> it's getting closer that way, but we don't have a king. We have a president. We have a division of powers. But we don't have a king. However, I believe that we can use these principles and these things that God has given us here. If we're looking at a man that, that is going to be the king, hey, why not apply these same principles to someone who might be a president, right? Look at verse number 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are, out, that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. So the very first thing they look at is, well, who would God want to be king? Who is God endorsing as being a man to be king over this country? That's the first step. Look out among you someone who is a God-fearing man that God would say, yes, this would be an acceptable person to have as a king. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. And as we read this, you'll notice there's some things back to the origins and foundation of this country. There are rules in place that, that follow what this says because a long time ago, there were God-fearing people as a majority in this land and that did look to the Bible as their source of truth and wisdom. And, and you know, laws have changed over time. A lot of things have changed over time. But here's one. You know, he says, you shouldn't have a stranger. That's why and today, even today, we have... You know, a, a foreign born, you know, a foreigner can't be president of the United States, supposedly. <laughs> now there's debate over 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 people in office or whatever, but but I mean that's the law of the land still, right? It's that that if you're born in another country, you can't you can't be um, the president of the United States. And God said that here for the king, He said if you're going to choose yourself a king, don't choose a foreigner. It's someone that has to be have their roots here in the land. And it says in verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Now, what were the horses good for? The horses were for battle. He's saying, don't get a king that's just going to build up this huge military. Why? 
Because the faith needs to rest in God. Now, he didn't say, have no military. He just said to multiply, all, you know, and just, just to really greatly expand all of these horses, you know, to have, um, to be this superpower. Because God is the one who protects the nation. God's the one who lifts up and God's the one that we need to be relying on. We don't want to replace God with a man in this government. But let's keep reading here some other things. Verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, not really an issue today, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So we don't want somebody that's just this super rich person, someone who multiplies to themselves silver and gold. Why? Because they're covetous, because they're focused on earning all of that money. They're, they're not going to be focused on the right things and true things and just things. It's just going to be all about the money for them. Verse 18, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom. Look at this. Now, it's been a long time, I think, since anybody fit the bill for this that has even been an option. That he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. He's saying, if you're going to choose out a king, someone that reads their Bible every day, right. someone all the days of his life, he's reading God's word, he's getting the wisdom, he's understanding what true justice is. If you're going to judge an entire nation and be responsible and, and rule over them, <laughs> you need this book every day. Amen. You need to understand God's law. You need to understand right from wrong. You need to understand the right decisions to make and to get that wisdom that only comes from this book. Now you tell me who, as a candidate, you can honestly say is reading their Bible every single day of the week. It's been proven. You can, you can see when Christians come and talk to these people, they don't know the Bible. They know some stories here and there. They know some things about it. But it's evident that they are not reading. I mean, when you just have a conversation with someone, you could know the people who read their Bible every day from those that don't. Of experience of talking with people, I know that for a fact. I mean, you, could, you talk to people and you bring up something in the Bible and it, you get the deer in the headlights look. If you're reading your Bible every day, you should know those things, and especially the law. I mean, if you're going to be the executive, the executor of the law, you should know the law. And we ought to have a, a godly country that follows God's laws. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Last place we're going to turn, 1 Samuel chapter 8, because we're going to see what, what God has to say over even them having a king. And for as many good things that have come out of this country and the foundation thereof and, and the, um, the structure is better than any man-made man -made structure has been, I still don't think I'm not this, you know, the Constitution of the United States is not my religion. Amen. I do not think that that is the be-all, end-all of all governments. I think there's something better than what was already established here. Now, it followed a lot of great truths and principles, which is why we received blessings from God. And, and you know, the, the government itself, the, the, the words written on the paper didn't make this nation great. What made this nation great was the people. The people who, who, who feared God and read the Bible. And there were a lot more of those types of people. And that's where the blessings came from. The people who, who had a heart to serve the Lord, those are the ones that get blessed by God. 1 Samuel chapter 8, look at verse number 1. Bible reads, And it came to pass when Samuel was old. See, Samuel was the, was the last judge. He was the judge of the land, which is what God had ordained, to have judges. To have people who understood right from wrong to be the judge in matters. Not to have a king, but just someone who can judge between right and wrong. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel which is not something that God ordained either. God didn't, get, didn't ordain a, a, a family hierarchy of just, you know, it passes from father to son to son to son to son, you know, this, 
He didn't ordain that for the judges. If you go back and read the judges, there's, there's God lifted up different people from different backgrounds, different families. It didn't matter. It was just whoever was going to serve God. It didn't have to be in a family line. But in any case, he made his sons judges over Israel. Verse number two. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre. Lucre is just money. So they took bribes and perverted judgment. Not good judges at all. They were wicked people. Verse number four. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So they go to Samuel and say, Look, you're old. You were a good judge. We liked you, Samuel. You did what was right. But your sons... They're not, they're not like you. They're not judging the way they ought to be judging. So they recognize that, which is a good thing. They're saying, hey, we need to get rid of these judges. But their solution was incorrect. They should not have said, jumped from your, your sons being judges to now give us a king. They should have just gotten different judges for the land instead of, instead of going with, with uh, Samuel's sons and, and kept the system of government that, that they had already been under. But he says, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Verse 6, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So it displeased Samuel. Samuel's like, you want a king? What are you talking about? You shouldn't have a king. And he goes and prays to God, and God says, you know what? Listen to him. Fine, give them their king. He says, and don't you worry about it because they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. See, the, ultimately it came down to it. They didn't want God to be their ruler and their authority. They wanted to substitute God with a man, with a king. Verse 8, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. So God says, okay, look, you, you could listen to their voice, but give them that, you know, protest unto them and just say, you know, very seriously, okay, if you really want a king, this is the way the king's going to be. And just describe the king to them so they know what they're getting into. And Samuel does that. And this is what happens now. Again, we don't have a king today, but when you just put a man in charge of things, this is what's going to happen. When you put someone with that type of power and authority, he says, this is what's going to happen. Verse number 11. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. So he's going, to take, he's going to take some of your children and just draft them into his military. He's just going to take them, and they're going to be his security, his forces, you know, part of the military that he has ordained. Because a king, what do you do when you're doing as a king? Well, the king now all of a sudden gets these new responsibilities. The king is saying, well, you are responsible for our safety. And see, they had replaced God being responsible for their safety with a man being responsible. So what's a man going to do? Well, if you put me in charge, say, well, I'm, I'm responsible for your safety. Okay, I need some guns. I need some you know, muscle. I need some help. I need to get people. For, you know, that's what a man's going to do. It's a natural thing that's going to happen, but it's not what God had ordained. And he's just letting them know, look, when you do this, you better be willing to give up your sons. These days, it's your sons and daughters. Verse 12, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. So now he's going to use them. Not only is he bring soldiers in, but he's going to, you know, he's going to need food. He's going to need supplies for his, for his army. And he's going to need people to make the weapons of war and to do all this stuff. So it's going to impact you even further. Verse number 13, and he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. So they used to take the girls to, to do these types of jobs, not to actually go out and fight in the front lines like this godforsaken land has done. Verse 14, and he will take your fields and your vineyards and your oliveyards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. 
So he's saying, he's going to take your stuff. He's going to tax you. He's going he's to basically take what he wants. The best of your stuff, he's going to take it and set up his, his lobbyists, right? His special interest groups are going to get the best of, uh, of your stuff. He said, that's what's going to happen. Verse 16, and he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall, look at this in verse 18, and ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you. He's talking about people choosing a king. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. And you're going to choose yourself out a king. You're going to choose him. And this is what he's going to do. And then when all of a sudden you don't like it anymore, you're like, well, I, don't, I didn't want that to happen. Well, I didn't want him doing this. I you're the one that put him in charge. God's saying, you live with him now. Right. You put him in place there. And I look at the people that are running for office, and you want me to choose one of these people? And then when things go bad, they say, well, what do you mean I got to buy in health insurance now? What do you mean I have to do this? What do you mean I got to buy government insurance? God's not going to listen to your cry. You pick someone like that and put him in charge. He's not going to listen to you. He says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They wanted a king to fight their battles for them. They didn't want to do the work themselves, and they didn't want to rely on God. If we want to have a righteous nation, it's, not, it's definitely not going to come through the politics. It's not going to come through the presidency. It's not going to come through who's in office there. The people have to decide, I want God to rule over me. When you make that type of decision, that's what God blesses. Honestly, the, the government will follow what the people are going to do. And based on all the things that we read here, I can't, I can't in good conscience say, I want this person to be, to be having that office. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, the Bible, dear Lord, and, and the clear instruction that you've given us, dear God. It's not the most positive sermon, and I don't typically go into politics very much, dear Lord, but there's so much ignorance about your word and, and what we need to, to use as our guiding light, dear God. And this isn't meant to just be a downer of a sermon, just to be hopeless, because the, the solution and the answer is to go out and to reach people, to, to reach the people with the gospel of Christ, with the light of your word, and to start changing hearts and minds one person at a time. We can only do so much, dear Lord. Uh, a person cannot uh, achieve power and legislate morality or, or dictate what people should believe. But we can go out and do the groundwork and do the legwork of trying to reach individuals to lead them to Christ, to, to show them the truth of your word, dear God. And we could start to, to, to bring people that life which exists through your Son and that changes lives, dear Lord. Help us to make the biggest influence that we can at least in our local area where we could bring the gospel of Christ to people and their lives could be changed through your power, dear God. And that uh, you know, the politics that they have will follow as a result of their obedience to you and to your words, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.